Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. My name is Kim Ricketts, and I'm here today to introduce and welcome Stephen Baker, who is visiting us as part of the Microsoft Research Visiting Speaker Series. Stephen is here today to discuss the world of the numerati, a global elite of computer scientists and mathematicians, don't you love being called elite? Yes. Um, who are involved in every realm of human affairs, whether it be creating new political groupings, upping our consumer power, or transforming healthcare by diagnosing illnesses before you even have symptoms. The numerati is here with us to stay. Stephen Baker has written for Business Week for over 20 years, in covering Latin America, the Rust Belt, European technology, and a host of other topics, including blogs, math, and nanotechnology. Baker has written for the Wall Street Journal, the Los Angeles Times, the Boston Globe, and many other publications. His portrait of the rising Mexican auto industry won an Overseas Press Club Award. He is the co-author of Blogspotting.net, featured by the New York Times as one of the 50 blogs to watch. So please join me in welcoming Stephen Baker to Microsoft Research. Thanks a lot. Uh, it's nice to be here. You know, um, the PR people at Houghton Mifflin put these sort of impressive sounding newspapers into my biography because once upon a time I, I wrote tiny little dispatches for the Wall Street Journal uh, from places like Venezuela. But the real newspapers where I got a lot of experience were now defunct newspapers like the El Faso Herald Post and the Black River Tribune in Ludlow, Vermont. So anyway, a little bit of a little bit of a promo sometimes in the, gets into those things. One of the things that, um, I'm on this tour for this book, and I've been on it for two weeks, and I have another half week to go. And one of the things that I keep getting asked for what, some reason or another is what these people that I call the numerati have to do with the financial problems that we have in the world right now. <laughs> and it's funny that they ask because when I started this book, I, you know, it was clear one of the areas where they are most important is in finance, and it was so clear that it didn't seem fresh or new, and we just decided that it wasn't, everybody knew about the quants and finance, so I wasn't going to say anything new, so junk that, and let's go to the sexier stuff like elections and, like, you know, voting and, um, and shopping and computer dating and things like that. So. But I still get asked, and uh, you know, just a couple days ago, the people from Mifflin said, "Come up with something about finance. You can tie it to the book because then we'll get you on TV. <laughs> and if they get get me on TV, then I'll get you know, sell a lot. Of my Amazon ranking will go like this, so I get on the Today Show or something. So if any of you have any ideas that can help me <laughs> figure out how these people had to do with with mess we're in, or better yet, how they can help us get out of it." I'm all ears, and I will, I will channel you as I go on the Today Show or uh, the Colbert Report. Um, but one thing, you know, and I, 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 I've sent the, the few contacts I have at, at Goldman and Lehman Brothers emails, frantic emails asking for their input, and for some reason they're not answering them. I don't know why. Um, but one thing I did hear is that um, if you look at credit applications or mortgage applications in around the year 2000, they asked for a lot of details about people and you know what their employment background was and how much money they made and their credit history and things like that. And as the years passed, they asked for less and less information. And this kind of goes against the whole theme of my book, which is that there's all of this information available about all of us so that people in every realm can find all kinds of data about us and understand us and sell to us and give us advertising and figure us out as voters. And yet in finance, they were moving in the other direction. They were taking rounded people and turning them into ants. And so it kind of goes back, it kind of takes things the other way. I thought that was, that's all I can say right now if they get me on the Colbert Report. Um, anyway, I'll tell you about the genesis of this book. I was working at, Biz I work at Business Week. And I pitched this cover story in the summer of 05. And the idea was that the US tech industry might be heading into a decline because of fewer gra graduating fewer engineers and scientists, behind in broadband, behind in wireless, 9-11 visa regulations. 
I went on and on, and the editors all yawned and said, we've kind of heard that before. It sounds like Thomas Friedman's book. I said, okay. He said, is there any, it's kind of an important theme, though. Is there any other way that we can discuss this? And one of the, one of the science editors said, math is at the heart of all of these competitive issues. So, and the editor-in-chief said, why don't we just do a cover story on math? Nobody writes about math. Incidentally, I have something I want to show. So, um, I don't have, have audiovisuals, but I have a couple props. Anyway, so um, he said, let's write a cover story in math, and he, let's, get somebody, let's get somebody who's not too brainy to do it, and he appointed me. <laughs> and I didn't really know much about math at all, and I still don't. But I went around, and I talked to people at M MIT, and I called up the usual suspects, and asked them about math in the most general terms, and I learned all kinds of interesting things but I had no idea what my story was going to be. And then I went to IBM Research in um, uh, Yorktown, New York, and this, uh, the head of their stochastic analysis division, Samer Takridi, told me that he and his team of 40 were, had this, were embarked on this project to build mathematical models of 50,000 of their colleagues. And these are, uh, this was... Um, modeling the uh, consultants at IBM, a group of them. And they were going to get data from all of these different sources, the emails and the calendars and all that, and, and the resumes, and try to, you know, what people were allergic to, what airports they lived near, and try to build models of them so that they could be deployed more efficiently. So I thought, if he can do that with workers, then other people can do that with shoppers, voters, et cetera, et cetera. And that's how the idea came together. And I did this cover story, and it really didn't have that much to do with math, full disclosure. It was much more data mining and computer science, really. But this was the cover story. And it really sold well, because people, even if it's not math, if it says it on the cover, there, there's, a, there's a crowd of people that are interested in things like that. And later, I pitched this as a, as a book, and I, I got this book contract. But as I was working on this cover story, I, I, um, I came out of the IBM interview and I said, um, I called up my roommate who, was a, who has a PhD in computer science, my roommate from college. And I called him and I said, I am going to do the most exciting cover story you can imagine. I'm going to do this mathematical modeling of humanity. I had this, I, I, I was full of the passion of the, the ignorant, but, um, <laughs> You know, the, it was excitement. And I, I, I raved on at his email for a couple minutes and then forgot about it. And then uh, about a couple weeks later, I got a phone call from him. And he said, I'm really concerned about that cover story of yours. He said, have you ever heard of garbage in, garbage out? I've heard of that. He said, have you heard the story about the drunk and the light and the looking for the key. I'm sure you've all heard of that story. The guy's looking for the key because that's where the light is, even though that's not where the, the key is. So he gave me sort of um, 101 on what to watch out for in this world. And um, I went on, and I, you know, at this, I've told this story once or twice before, and it, he actually called me on my, as I was on my way for an interview at Google, and I was thinking this morning, should I cut out that Google bit for the Microsoft talk? But then I thought, well, it's not that flattering to Google, so I think I'll go ahead and tell it to him. <laughs> I, 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 said, I went to Google and I talked to uh, Craig Silverstein, who was one of the, I guess, the first employee. And I said, you know, that story about the drunk and the key, is that something I should be keeping in mind? And he said, when I was in middle school, there was a science fair project, and I came up with, I had this experiment, and I came up with all this terrific data. And then I realized the experiment was flawed. And so I tried to come up with a new experiment that I could hitch up to the data that I'd already generated. <laughs> and uh, it was at that point that I said, you know, this mathematical modeling of humanity, it might happen. But if it does, it's going to happen first in areas where people can afford to make a whole lot of mistakes. And so, you know, marketing and advertising are two <laughs> key areas for that, that uh, thing. Anyway, uh, so my book is about this nascent effort, this modeling of humanity. And, you know, it's just looking at where we are in trying to figure out patients, trying to figure out voters, 
uh, trying to understand blogs and use them for uh, market research, uh, modeling, um, did, went to IBM to do the modeling the workers. It's just this tour through this world. And a lot of these efforts are really, you know, I think we'll look back and say they're pretty primitive. They make lots of mistakes. They really don't understand us in, in a lot of meaningful ways. But the standard isn't whether they're true or not, or whether they understand humans and all of our complexity. The standard is if they understand us just a little bit better than what the status quo was before, enough so that they can make money. And if they can, then they keep on doing it, and they learn a little bit more, and, and, and it progresses. And that's where I think we are in this thing. And I, you know, uh, So I'm not here to make any tremendous promises that I, I'm sure you would, you know, I don't need to make them to you anyway, but anyway. Um, so, oh, and the other thing is, it's, it, it, the, the important thing isn't that it's true. It's that it, it provides incredible scale and efficiency so that you can deal with millions of people at the same time. And that's, that's why, these, why these schemes that I'm talking about have such tremendous power. You can, for the first time, we can compare people to a million or 10 million or 100 million other people. I thought I'd walk you through a few of the, um, these through a few of the case studies that I did. One has to do, a lot of them put us into new tribes. You know, they take a look at the old, old ones where we were understood by our demographics or our region or our race and, and replace it with new ones that are based much more on our behavior. And one of these is in politics. I went to this uh, political consultancy in Washington called Spotlight. And like so many others, they're trying to micro-target swing voters. And one of their ideas is that, where are we, September 30th? If on September 30th, an American voter doesn't know what, who he or she is going to vote for, that person really isn't terribly engaged in the political process and isn't thinking about the issues the way that the politicians and the politically involved people are. They're thinking about things in another way. But those are the people who are going to likely swing the elections in key states like Ohio, Wisconsin, New Mexico, Nevada. So how do you understand those people? You don't do it by the issues that they don't really spend a lot of time thinking about. How do you find those people? So they did, they basically co-opted uh, corporate marketing techniques. They took about 4,000 people that they thought represented a cross-section of the American voters and they gave them lengthy interviews where they talked about all kinds of things that they were, what are you scared of? What do you hope for? What do you want your kids to do? Sort of looking at the future through their eyes at what scared them, what were they excited about, but not politics. And then to fill out these, these uh, profiles, they of course asked them a lot of questions about politics that they could look at the correlations. So they had 4,000 people, they gave them to Yankelovich and Partners, which is a company that analyzes consumer, or, you know, consumer behavior. They said, are these people divided into, can you divide these people into any sort of recognizable groupings? And they could, and they did, and they, they said, these are five tribes, and you can divide each tribe into a more zealous and a less zealous. So a total of 10 tribes, and some were people who focus on righteousness. And some were people who focus on community. And those are pretty clearly Democrat and Republican. But they were interested in the ones in the middle who, who uh, really cared deeply about freedom. That's a pie in the sky term, but they found, you know, they found there was something about these people around freedom. And there was one group of them that they call barn raisers. They have names for all these people, right clicks civic centuries, but these people, the barn raisers, care deeply about right and wrong, playing by the rules, those sorts of things. They care about morality, but they're not terribly religious as a rule. They're swing voters. They represent 8% of the population, which is 14 million voters. And um, they voted for President Bush by 90%, 90 to 10 in 04. And two years later, they went Democrat 50 to 60 percent in the congressional elections. So they think oh, that they have their eyes on, a, on a, a new swing voting group. It's not a demographic. It's this tribe that exists only in their database. But how do they get 14, how do they, 
they have the, the um, 3,000 that they know about, and they, so the, the barn raisers are 8% of those 3,000. But how do they find barn raisers in the rest of the country? They have to do a, a model based on demographics and consumer behavior of these, the barn raisers that they have. Then they test it against the control group that they know, and then they take that model and they run it a, across 175 million voters to pick out the 14 million barn raisers. And so they've done that with every one of us. Everyone here who's an, a U.S. voter exists in one of these tribes or another. These, and, and that's just for Spotlight. I'm sure we exist in many other tribes for other political consultants. So what they want to do is hit those barn raisers with specific ads in places like Milwaukee, Santa Fe, swing states that, that emphasize the points that they seem to care about. They think that their technique gets three out of, is 75% accurate. So, so three out of four people that they, tar that they call barn raisers are barn raisers, and the other 25% are something kind of close, one of those freedom tribes, but not, necess you know, not one of the community or righteousness tribes. So, uh, a lot of people complain, that I talk to complain about this. They think it's kind of weird and scary and it's the automation of American politics and we're being treated like things. But I say we've always been treated like herd animals, you know? They've looked at us as one ethnic group or another or one urban group or another voting precinct. And so they're actually trying to understand us as something closer to the people we are, even though they use strange statistical techniques. Another, uh, another um, area that I covered was medicine. I went to Intel down, up, uh, down, no, I'm in Seattle, down in Portland, and they've wired the homes of several scores of elderly people with all kinds of sensors. And they're trying to measure absolutely everything these people do in their homes, the, the, the nature of their strides, how they shift their weight on the kitchen floor. They've got sensors under tiles to measure how they shift their weight on the kitchen floor. The strength of their voice, the, the length of time it takes them to recognize a voice on the telephone. Um, all kinds of things. They establish baselines for each of those behaviors. And if they see a deviation from the baseline, that points to some problem. And eventually, they want to be able to diagnose it automatically, or at least come up with a suggested diagnosis automatically. And they're looking at things like Alzheimer's, uh, Parkinson's disease. Um, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's. Oh, loss of muscle mass in the legs or loss of balance that would lead to a catastrophic fall. I mean, their, their theory is that there are a lot of people who, um, well, right now, a lot of middle-aged people have aging parents that they can't, that they're hard-pressed to keep track of and take care of, and that as, as this generation ages, we're going to need more and more of this home health care. I'm sure you pe people at Microsoft have all kinds of projects along using the same, following the same ideas. Um, you know, I think eventually this is going to raise all kinds of questions for, for society about insurance. If the insur what happens if the insurance company calls you and says, I'll give you a 30% discount on your health insurance if you put a few sensors in your house. You know, I think increasingly we may be faced with those sorts of questions, which will raise further questions about the very nature of insurance, which is an industry that relies on a certain amount of ignorance. And as we learn more, we're not going to be as ignorant in what happens to the insurance industry. Uh, in, the, in the auto industry, there's a company called um, Progressive that's offering people discounts to put black boxes in their car. And they measure where they go, how they drive, which neighborhoods they go in, what times they drive. They're trying to assess their risk. And I talked about this to one group, and, and I asked if anybody would be interested in that. And a guy said, well, not for me, but for my kid. <laughs> and I think that that's going to happen more and more is that middle-aged people are going to impose these surveillance systems on their parents and their kids. And those are going to be the test populations. And if it works, and the, the results are good, then I think more and more of us are going to embrace it for ourselves for it, the life-enhancing qualities. Um, 
But like so many others, the business case for this starts out with really basic things that have less to do with the numerati and more to do with just reporting simple facts. One of the things is um, weighing people. My mother actually participated in this Intel study in Portland. And she was 90 and suffering from congestive heart failure and extremely weak and frail. And they told her she should weigh herself every day and report the uh, conclusion, you know, you know, report her weight every day. Well, she didn't remember that often. She wouldn't remember to weigh herself every day at that point in her life. And I bought, but I bought a scale for her, one of these digital scales. And as soon as I gave it to her, I realized it was absolutely futile because it takes a strong tap to activate that. And it was, she couldn't double click. She had a hell of a time with a mouse, you know, double clicking. And uh, tapping that scale was beyond her. And then even if she had remembered to weigh herself and successfully tapped the scale, she wouldn't be able to see uh, the, the numbers. So there were like three data collection obstacles right there with my mother. Well, at Intel, they've wired beds, people's beds so that they can weigh them in bed. And that's a useful thing, you know? People, would pay, people might pay for that. It's very primitive, but these things start with primitive hookups. The only trouble is there was one case where a woman gained eight pounds in the middle of the night, and uh, they thought she was taking on fluids, and should they get an ambulance over there? And it turned out her little dog had jumped on her bed. So the data is not always that clean. Um, when I went to IBM, well, I did this, I did this uh, cover story. And the nice thing about writing cover stories for a magazine like Business Week is I can go to IBM and they can tell me, we're going to model 50,000 workers. And I can say, IBM is going to model 50,000 workers picking up data from email, blah, 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 and, and lay it out in a paragraph, and maybe even in a second paragraph. After that, I don't really have to know too much about it. I don't really have to know how they do it because I'm on to my next example. But when I'm writing my book, I had to go to IBM and say, you know that thing that I spent two paragraphs in the book talking about? Could you walk me through that and tell me how you, how you plan to model 50,000 consultants? So they did. They, they walked me through it at some length. And what it, they use old tool, they use hand-me-down tools from different, from different uh, disciplines. For example, they use financial tools to analyze the, the skills, to put, to put a value on the skills that people have so that they can do a business plan and say, this is where we project our company's going to be in five years, and these are the skills that we're going to need. So how much are these skills worth? And how many, you know, how many skills do we need? And so they, looking at skills, valuing people's contacts, valuing, giving, trying to create some kind of value for where they s sit in their network according to the email patterns, all of these things go into numbers which each person becomes sort of like a mutual fund of different skills going up and down. And, and it's not at all what people are. But it gives them some way to try to get a handle on how to va evaluate them and project their value in the future. So it's not, it's not that close, but it might work to some degree. And then the other one that they use that's a big hand-me-down is uh, operations research. And you know, during World War II, the, um, the convoys were crossing the North Atlantic to arm Britain and they kept getting sunk by German U-boats. And so the US and Britain really put together teams of mathematicians that turned the North Atlantic into an entire mathematical battle, battleground, or if you call a, an ocean a battleground. Well, anyway, and they, um, and they figured out how to optimize the convoys to minimize the damage. You know, how many destroyers should surround each convoy? How, how many boats should be in each convoy? They figured which routes they should take. They optimized it, lowered the, uh, the uh, casualties along the way, and it was very, very successful. And later, after the war, IBM used that same science to optimize its own supply chain. So they 
developed, they developed all kinds of efficiencies, they saved a lot of money, and then they used that knowledge to create a new service business and they sold their, their um, supply chain smarts to the rest of the world. And everybody optimized their supply chain either with IBM Science or somebody else's. And now IBM has moved to a much more service company for manufacturing and if they were to try to optimize their supply chain, it would be its people. And so that's what they're trying, that's what the Creedy's team is trying to do is sort of optimize their people. And they're using a lot of, a lot of the hand-me-down techniques from operations research. And again, it doesn't really, this wasn't built for people, but if it works and provides some kind of incremental improvement, then they'll go with it. And I guess one of my questions for you, and I'd, I'd be interested in hearing what you have to say about this, is if we, have a, if we have systems that improve because they, they, they get better results and they try to analyze people and through the years and through the decades we fine tune them and fine tune them but the very platforms that they're built upon were built for financial instruments and for machine parts is this the wrong way to try to understand people? I don't really know. I, but that's the, way, that's the way that I think a lot of people are heading because that's the way that works for today and tomorrow. And this whole industry is based on, what, on today and tomorrow. It's not based on a clean sheet of paper that might work in five years. Maybe that's being done in universities. Maybe it's being done at, in research departments like this one. But I think it's going to be basically built on the same systems that understand finance and machine parts. Um, I went to Yahoo and I asked um, the head of research there, Prabhaka Raghavan, about the challenges of trying to dig through these mountains of data trying to understand consumers and building services for them. And he, he gave me kind of a primer on managing massive amounts of data and he taught, told me about overfitting and all these other problems that you have with data and, and somehow you can get overwhelmed by it and you can dive down rat holes chasing various correlations that turn out to not have any meaning. And so then I went to the National Security Agency and I met with the chief mathematician there. This was about three weeks, this was in the summer of 06 and they had gotten into a lot of trouble, well, a lot of controversy because they had been, they'd been uh, consuming amount, immense streams of, of internet and telephone data. And so I was very worried about my interview with him. I was worried that he would object to my questions and storm out and shut the do slam the door. And so I was a little bit tentative when I asked him questions. And I started out by saying, you know, these people at Yahoo were telling me that sometimes you get too much data. Is that a, is that a problem for you? He said, the people at Yahoo might not know how to store their data. And they might not ask it the right questions. And they might get confused by the data. But no, you can never have too much data. <laughs> and uh, so that is, that is my, my story. I've got this book. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm happy to answer any questions or talk, you know, talk to you more about, uh, about the numerati if you'd like to. Yeah. Your discussion about how you divided the political people into tribes, or how that was being done, yeah. was any follow-up done to see how successful they were in converting an undecided into a decided? And number one, and number two, the right decided, because I presume they had an agenda. That's, That's right. right. The, the group that I was... Right, yeah. The question, I, I don't know if the, the question comes through in the... Not as well. Yeah. The question is about the conversion rate in the, in, the political, in the political thing. I would say if they are doing those conversion studies, they're doing them and will only publicize them if they benefit their consultancy. You know? I think in come December, there's going to be a lot of chest thumping by whichever was the winning side and a lot of claims about having a uh, swung Ohio or Wisconsin for one candidate or the, or the other. And there is a lot of hype in this field. There's some truth and a whole lot of hype and a lot of marketing. So I don't really know. It'll be interesting to find out. Maybe somebody will give me the inside look, but I don't know about their, 
about their uh, luck in that. Yeah. Any others? Yeah. I, it was, I enjoyed hearing you talk, um, brought up a lot of stuff. Um, I was just thinking about one place where they've been very successful doing this, which is sort of the credit rating industry, and they yes. get a whole lot of potentially unrelated information and turn it into our credit rating. Um, and then, in my mind, they failed to adapt, and they failed to change, and but they still have so much power. Um, I mean, they're, they're so powerful that no matter how bad they are at this point, they're going to maintain, or at least until they get so bad that the economy collapses, um, that they maintain a dominance in the industry. And I have all sorts of things to say, but it seems to some extent you're talking about the democratization of predictions or something. Right. <laughs> um, so I, I just thought that was interesting. Um, I mean, there's a, that's a case of potentially abuse of power and and modeling. Um, and then the no, other you're talking about like fair Isaac or Standard and Poor's. Um, yeah, more like individuals. I was thinking, not not corporate. So um, yeah, like fair, fair Isaac. Isaac. Your FICO score is one. Um, the other the other thing is you said they predict like 75 percent of the time, and we think that's good. Yeah, but. What about the other 25% of the people? That sort of isn't the foundation upon which our country was based, is that you can just ignore minorities or people who don't fit your models and, or treat them differently or, you know? Well, so you do that when you're running a standard political operation and you think that there's a Democrat, like if you go into Philadelphia, which is a highly Democratic city, you run, cam you run commercials for the Democrats to get them out to vote, and you just forget about all the Republicans that are there because they're a minority that you're not paying attention but to. But that's just going well beyond politics. I mean, this is driving down into people's lives. We're talking healthcare. Right. You know, I mean, monitoring their homes and maybe what if they're those twenty-five percent of the people, and the healthcare company looks at the data rather than the person. Well, it's. I think it's. It's made for poli areas where it doesn't matter if you're, if they think you're a barn raiser, and Obama sends you an ad saying, you know, I really care about right and wrong, and nobody's been playing by the rules, and blah blah blah. Yeah, and that's not a big deal. You just get the wrong advertisement that's not micro fitted to you. But in the in medicine, it's a whole different game, and so I think it's going to be longer before these 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 people make great strides in medicine. It's where they need it the most, but yeah. Yeah? What have been uh, social and kind of legal responses to the ability to kind of profile people and you know, crunch numbers to come with an idea of, you know, hold this group, hold that group, which action this way, that way? I mean, have there been laws of, of right and wrong way of using that? Or, and what's been kind of society's response to the ability to do that? You mean to the privacy issues? In some, uh, in some respect as well. Um, I don't know. Does anybody else have any thoughts about that? Uh, I can't say. Has there been any like, government regulation or attempted? Well, there, there's a lot of talk about different regulations. And I, but, you know, there are, there are very strict ones about medicine. But as far as Profiling for things like advertising and marketing, I don't think there's much. I don't think there's much of regulation at all. There are much stricter regulations in Europe than there are here. I know that, but I don't really have specifics on that. I'm sorry to say. Yeah. So one of the key issues here, when we are talking about this mathematical model of humanity, is that people have a lot of privacy concerns, and yes. I think that's one thing that's that's stop, that's that's maybe stopping a lot of things from already being modeled more. Right. Uh, how do you see that panning out? Do you see uh, these the numerati becoming more aware of people's privacy and building in maybe new, uh, I guess, ways to protect people's privacy? Or do you see people becoming less concerned about privacy? I, see, I see both. I see people redefining privacy and trying to come to grips with what, look, consider the secrets that you have. And then which secrets should you keep in the future or should you attempt to keep in the future? And there's some secrets that you, you know, traditionally you've kept them, but you don't really need to. Then there, there are other ones you want to keep. And I think a role for a company like Microsoft, and I know you're 
at work on it is to create tools for people to protect themselves and for industries to provide services where you can get the benefits from sharing information without the costs of exposing yourself to, to loss of privacy or loss of money. I mean, this is imp especially important in, uh, I talked to one of your colleagues, Cynthia Dwork. I don't know if she still works for Microsoft down in San Francisco. Yeah. And she was talking to me about, you know, medical, medical data and how you could, if you, if you zeroed in on it, it was, it was impossible to see the individual. I mean, that's, that's the real key. It's, it's a real opportunity for, for companies like this one, I would think. Now, I said that to Google. I went to Google uh, two weeks ago. And I said, you know, people at IBM are really concerned about this article. I see it. The book excerpt ran as a cover. The, uh, it, and it was about the IBM chapter. It was about modeling workers and whatnot. And it took out the most, you know, the most noteworthy stuff. And so it, it didn't have some of the softening elements of the book. And the IBM people were very upset about it. It made it look like they were a big, big brother company. And they, they wanted me in my talks about this to say that there were, that was a, pro, a pilot project and their, their um, surveillance of employees is done on an opt-in basis now. But uh, I, then I went to Google and I said, you know, these people at IBM were really concerned about that. And, uh, but I'd assume at Google, where, where all data is just considered information to, to be analyzed, that you would assume that people are looking at your patterns, your workplace patterns, and trying to figure you out and make you more productive or help you cr come up with better ideas or whatever. And they were horribly offended by that idea. And a couple of them denounced me for even suggesting it. And the word evil came up into the conversation <laughs> more than once. And so, you know, I would be interested. I don't know what the, what the, the thinking here is at Microsoft, but uh, I, just, I just assume that if companies aren't, do, aren't looking at that kind of data, it's just because they haven't gotten around to it yet. But I mean, not that, you know, not that you can build predictive models of IBM, I mean, Microsoft researchers, but there's something to be learned. I don't know what you think about that. Yeah. I wonder if you've come across any projects where people are trying to do real-time profiling. You know, for instance, I'm on vacation and I just bought lunch. Maybe now I'm more prone to go buy dessert. Rather well, than history. I don't think you need a model to figure that out. <laughs> <laughs> well, the one. The one company that I talked to that I thought was doing something interesting in that area, do you know Sense Networks? They come out of MIT and they've put this software into telephones so that they can track all these people's movements. And they do it, they're doing it in San Francisco and it's the coolest thing in the world to look at this map of San Francisco and see these various people they, uh, moving through it. And so they think that if you look at a city as sort of like the physical internet, then the corner, the, such and such a corner of Lombard Street and something else in San Francisco is like a web page. And if you, if you stand on that corner between, let's say, 9 o'clock and 10.30 p.m., then you and everybody else who stands on that corner at that time have something in common, just like people who visit a certain web page. And so then if you look back at their patterns, like, where do most of the people who, come, who go to that corner sleep? And you might see that a certain number of them come from this area. And then where are they at 2 in the morning? Well, you might see that they're in this certain clubs. And then you can define the people that have those patterns as a tribe or a group that you can market to. And that, it, that could bring real-time market, marketing, the kind you're talking about. Interestingly, um, I mean, this is this is just beginning. This 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 thing just launched a couple months ago. Sense Networks, but the investors in Sense Networks aren't VCs. It's a hedge fund, and it's you know you figure for a hedge fund it's like four million bucks, which is nothing, even in today's climate, and they get this raw data of people's movements within New York, San Francisco, and other cities. And if they can use that to try to understand something about what consumers are up to, they might be able to, you know, understand the economy just $4 million better. So, yeah. 
you thought about generational or cohort differences with regard to even the privacy or acceptance of this? Because just based on, on what I see, I think like uh, the younger teens and things who've grown up with the technology and are much more comfortable and familiar with it will be more comfortable with having this information used to... That's right. Well, I mean, if you look at the... If you look at the blogs and social networks, it's, it, there are many parts of our society that are spilling much of their lives, including intimate details of their lives, for the whole world to see. And that's a treasure trove for the data miners that want to figure out, do sentiment analysis on, on these people, or, or people in general, because they, just, they, they get a big enough sample and then they, they adjust, for the, adjust for the age. But one of the companies I visited was Umbria Communications, which is going through those blog posts and coming up with sentiment analysis for, for, you know, for marketing companies. And you know, right now, they're, all they're doing is a thumbs up or a thumbs down for um, a new, you know, the Jerry Seinfeld commercials. <laughs> but uh, in the future, they're going to be able to understand those, those messages, those writings with a lot more, a lot more nuance and, and context. Yeah. Um, you suggested earlier on that politics was borrowing from marketing. Yeah. But um, I've done some, I've worked on some marketing campaigns for another company. I kind of got the impression it came the other way. Okay. Which is that um, there are certain industries like politics where marketing wannabes can get a start. Uh -huh. uh, soap and soda or other places. Um, and then they go to conservative companies that are established and have a lot to lose. But when you're on a campaign that has pretty much no downside and a big upside, it's a chance for a young kid with some innovation to make a mark. And they're almost never going to do the, the safe, reliable thing that anybody sensible would do. All right? this is, this is, if you're going to make a mark, you have to do something where you know you've got a candidate who's probably not going to win, right? Um, and you gotta you gotta bet the farm on double zero, and come up with something truly creative. And if it works, you've now got a career. Well, um, now I think it's different when you're in the home stretch. Yes. Well, I just from my own experience having kids and friends who go into politics, they often get discouraged because they're the old pros who know all the precincts and know the way things are done. And I find that young, sharp 20-year-olds or 22-year-olds often get stuck stuffing envelopes and not having that kind of input. But if you look at what the creative new things coming out of you know, the more recent campaign, yeah. there are things that, the, um, that both the old pros never would have done. Right. right? And also, there are the things that the marketing companies are never doing. Yeah, you know, you're right. It's certainly, in terms of the internet stuff. So, for example, let's take um, um, you give you a five minute um, head start on knowing who the presidential, vice presidential pick is going to be. In exchange for that, I give you permission to text message me. Right. right? And, um, you know, they get a massive number of opt ins by this map. Right. This is something an old pro never would have thought of. Right. Right. Well, that's true. This campaign, the last one, is full of this kind of thing. If you look at what, how, you know, the CVs of the people in the conservative places that are doing marketing now, where they came from, they almost all came from one of those places where, you know, something like like uh, politics, where you didn't need a long CV to get in. Well, well that's interesting. I didn't, I didn't really think about that. Well, modern sort of research is born from from politics. Um, I think that's pretty much the genesis of it. Furthermore, I mean, the main, the, one of the big marketing things now is turning your most loyal customers into your marketers, which is what politics has always been all about, Viral right? <laughs> that's true. Yeah. It's yeah. about changing attitudes. I mean, um, with politics, it's easier because you have a very discreet choice in a very discreet period. Um, you know, it's the election that you have to impact their position before that. Um, and then it, it's, you know, it's ubiquitous after that with marketing products. Mm -hmm. I have a question, Steve. Yeah. How do you think, you know, the, the census, the American census is going to change? You know the way they, the government categorizes it. Oh, I know. I'm thinking about it. How, what do you think? Well, it's just, 
themes or okay, the questions that they even yeah. you know, ask. You know, it's, it's not very far-reaching. Right. Um, but they, they must use it to make decisions. About it. It's just that when you fool around with the census, I mean, I can imagine if people, if there were an open source movement to try to figure out what the best census would be, mm -hmm. it would be fascinating. Right. But then it would come up with all these privacy implications and there'd be massive debate about it. And it just seems like the census, for all its potential that it gives us, is one of these areas that's going to be really hard to change. But I don't know. And, and before the 2000 census, there was a proposal to actually do it by sampling. And all the mathematicians who work for the Census Bureau swore up and down that it would be more accurate if they were allowed to use sampling rather than you know, individually trying to count everybody. Right. And the politicians just would not hear of it. Yeah. So it was uh, voted down. Yeah. Yeah. I think a good example, one of the best examples of data privacy is the whole RFID thing. Yeah. Um, where, you know, they were going to put a radio frequency ID tag maybe in a piece of clothing at a retail store right. or something. And, you know, the benefits are great, right? Because potentially if you just push your cart through the register and it would just pick up everything all at once, nobody was having it. No. You know? We're putting the RFID chips in licenses. You had to be able to disable it. And, you know, passports now have them in there. And there's websites telling you to, like, take a hammer and smash it in a certain spot. Right. Um, so that it doesn't work. Right. Because if you do it any other way, you're defacing your passport and it's illegal. So if you right. carry it wrapped in aluminum foil. <laughs> <laughs> There's a whole market for Faraday cages for your passport. Did you want to say something like that? Well, I was, I was just going to mention that uh, I was looking into some of these uh, bills that were being passed, and I was researching some old bills for some reasons, and, and it found out that uh, some of the censuses were actually, uh, they were going back uh, three decades to pull up numbers to support the bill as opposed to using modern census. So it's kind of a, uh, ironic that uh, sometimes our, our government will actually say, oh no, go count everybody in that census, <laughs> when it, it, because at times when it's not beneficial to them, they'll go use an older census that right. they, and, and, and quote in the bill. That, that reminds me of, of my time as a steel reporter when I was in Pittsburgh, and I went to this cutting edge a rolling facility, steel rolling mill in Indiana that was half Japanese. It cost more than a billion dollars, which was incredible for the steel industry. And they take a, a, you know, a band of steel, flat rolled steel that's this fat, and they, in one continuous process, they roll it until it's like tin foil. And it's just the band goes on forever and ever. But the tricky part is that you have to weld together the, the, the ends of one band at the beginning of another. And that's done, you know, that was done electronically, and it was a high-tech thing they were very proud of. And um, so they show it to me, and they tell me how it's welded together really fast and really, and really um, strong. And I saw this hammer next to it. I said, what's that hammer doing there? They said, oh, those guys never trust the, the automatic welds. You know? <laughs> so I think those. Yeah. So I just recently purchased your book, and although I haven't had a chance to read it yet, um, but uh, it's a joke. <laughs> uh, I did notice that you had something in there related to RFID along the lines of what Josh was just mentioning. And I was wondering if you'd given any thought to um, uh, anything related to evening the value proposition with respect to some of these uh, instruments that were designed initially for, or primarily for uh, supply chain. Um, from the perspective of the consumer, um, these devices um, in pr products that you purchase that still actually would work when you have them in the home. Have you thought about something that, I mean, I know there's a long, long uh, set of uh, discussion around privacy and related to some of these things, but perhaps maybe if the value was sort of balanced out a little bit, giving consumers some value in having these in their products. Yeah. I mean, I haven't, got, I, I haven't come up with great ideas about it, but it just seems to me that Increasingly, we're going to be, ma be making deals where if we agree to use services and provide people with our data, we're going to be getting more and more advanced. They're going to have to offer us more and more advanced. As people become aware of how valuable their data is, they're going to be in a position to ask for great deals and great services in exchange for it. And I think that's where there's going to be a lot of business opportunities for companies that, that figure that out. But I don't have specific examples of that. I have a question. 
Yeah. So obviously the fear factor for people is huge. I know when you're on the radio and stuff, that's you know that's the biggest thing. That's what people are calling. People about, are right. terrified about accumulation. They want they want to go off the grid. Yeah. So, but do you think with as data collection becomes more sophisticated, if we have simultaneously much more sophisticated security, that that will ally some of it? Well, I think you know a lot of people a decade ago didn't would never put their credit card information online for e-commerce. That was a big deal. And so something happened to convince people that that was OK. And I think some, there will be some demythification that goes on. And people can take, you know, there's, scare, there's real scary stuff, and then there's fake scary stuff. And they can divide the two, hopefully. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, one, one thing I'm in market research, so I'm, I'm cheating a bit, but um, talking about data privacy is to think about the privacy of the data at the point of collection mm -hmm. rather than at the point when you're going to use it or just stuff into a database somewhere so that you can have separated it from identifying information. So a lot of times this data is collected inadvertently or um, sort of, I don't want to say subconsciously, but they're not really thinking about it as collecting data. They're thinking about it as part of a process. Right. Um, and if they had built in thoughts about the privacy and integrity of that information at the point where it was collected, you stand a much better chance of maintaining the privacy. Right. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. No, I think that's true. I think they're all kind of, I think this has been just a random helter skelter uh, evolution so far without many, many rules guiding it, without uh, best practices, and, uh, and a ton of really valuable wasted data. That's not a, that's not analyzed, and I think people are going to get figure things out. Yeah. Uh, on the subject of privacy, I found your uh, NSA <coughs> example intriguing. Um, what is the amount, what are you, what is your thoughts on the amount of infrastructure they have in place to you know profile people, et cetera? Because they're not out to sell people anything; they're trying to find the, the you know threats to America and lock them up. Um, are they miles ahead of the private sector? Or are they behind? What's your thoughts on that? Well, I don't know. I know they have real recruiting challenges because uh, they're competing with companies like this one when it comes to when it comes to recruiting the top mathematicians and computer scientists, and it's really hard for them with a, you know a civil service pay pay scale to compete with these big web companies, and and plus they're limited to American citizens, which further handicaps them, and they have had to turn their mission from you know cryptography and code breaking in during the entire cold war into data mining and the, this type of analysis and i can't imagine that they're ahead of the cutting edge of uh, private sector companies but that said i got no details from the guy i mean he he said you know they have supposedly the biggest math shop in the world. He went on and on about the huge challenge of weeding, you know, of finding truth in these mountains of data and leads and all the rest. And you know, I mean, we haven't gotten, we haven't had a terrorist attack since in this country since 2001. So you know, far be it from me to say they're not doing an effective job. But somehow, yeah, anthrax. You're right. Oh God. It was still well, anyway, no, but it was it was a terrorist it was a sort of terrorist attack. I mean, I don't know. It just seems to me that that was one chapter I really had trouble writing because it was not they're not successful. It's not a good science for them, really, for the most part. They don't have any pattern. They don't have good patterns of behavior or known patterns of behavior of terrorists the way they do, uh, you know, Cheerios buyers or or home buyers, you know, they don't have that kind of data, and um, it's a little bit like the space shuttle, you know. I mean, they, the space shuttle has two accidents, and so it doesn't give them much, much of a sample to work with. And so, what I did in that chapter was I looked at the two different approaches you can have toward it. One is, is um, the statistical analysis, you know, of data, just data mining, and the other is going through databases looking for correlation, looking for phone numbers that overlap, names that overlap, uh, aliases and things like that. There's this, there's this software called Nora, which is a non, 
relation awareness or something. Anyway, it, it goes through and tries to find people. And, you know, the guy who created Nora thinks that he could have stopped 9-11. They could have stopped it if they used something like his because it was clear that two guys who, had, who were associated with the bombing of the USS Cole were living in Los Angeles and it, they were in the phone book or, you know, they were, the data was there. Any other questions? Well, I appreciate you coming down today and spending some time with me. Be happy to sign any books if anybody wants wants one. Is that the blog? About the oh, this is yeah. This is my blog, thenumerati.net. My contact information is there. If you want to get in touch with me, my email's there. Um, feel free to leave all kinds of comments on the blog. I hate having zero comments on a post. <laughs> it's depressing. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Sure. Thank you.